Hi, this is the Tropical Tippet on Hurricane Ian, Tuesday, September 27th. As always, the thoughts in this video are mine alone, and in making decisions, please consult the National Hurricane Center and your local emergency management officials for the best information for where you are. This is Hurricane Ian, which crossed west of the Owl of Youth and then over the western part of Cuba, bringing life-threatening conditions to the western part of the island last night, and we're seeing a very well-organized core re-emerging on the other side this morning. This is not really what you want to see, a well-defined eye that has not been significantly disrupted by the terrain that it just crossed over during the last 6 to 12 hours. This is the Key West radar, courtesy of Mark Nissenbaum's site at FSU, and you can see the eye well-defined here with a closed eye wall, and especially the north and eastern eye wall, very strong echoes showing up in the radar here. We've seen lightning also occurring in the northern eye wall, indicating that the inner core of Ian is vigorous, and we're seeing lots of rain bands spreading now throughout the Florida Keys and into South Florida itself, with heavy rainfall occurring. Some of these storms are strong, and there are chances, uh, slight chances for tornadoes to occur uh, during the day today. This is the recon data from Ian showing the re-emergence off of the coastline of Cuba, which runs right about through here. The plane saw the pressure at 963 millibars at the time of re-emergence over water. It was 947 when it first made landfall in Cuba. So there was some weakening of the hurricane during the crossing, uh, but given its robust signature on satellite imagery with a clearing out eye and a closed eye wall, uh, we expect that reintensification will begin immediately, and we do see in the latest pass a 2 millibar fall already beginning back down to 961. We'll likely see that pressure value continue to come down, and winds will likely increase. We saw about 90 uh, to 110 mile per hour winds observed by the aircraft within the eye wall of Ian on the latest pass, and those winds will likely come up considerably as the eye begins to move fully away from land. We just saw the southern eye wall come off of Cuba within the last hour or two, and as the eye starts moving toward the north-northeast, uh, we'll likely see the core become even better organized, and intensification into a formidable hurricane with winds of at least 130 miles per hour is currently forecast by the National Hurricane Center. Now, the track coming off of Cuba here is also not something we were hoping to see. The heading is currently just east of due north on the radar and satellite imagery, and the hurricane did cross Cuba at a slightly farther east point than some models expected. Some models expected it to be farther toward the west. Those were the solutions that could have kept this more offshore of Florida, but now that the hurricane is a little bit farther east, this basically guarantees a landfall in the south central portion of the Florida coastline. Here's the latest track update from the National Hurricane Center, 11 a.m. Eastern time, showing the hurricane now emerging off of Cuba and making that east of due north motion, which is now walking the landfall location farther down the Florida coastline. Yesterday, the forecast was for a landfall near or just north of Tampa Bay. This is now walked down, and the current forecast is for a landfall in the vicinity of Sarasota. And this landfall is also getting a little bit earlier now Wednesday evening, because if the landfall is farther down the coastline, the hurricane will arrive sooner. And so we're seeing the timeline move up a little bit, and we're seeing the landfall location shifting south in light of the recent trends in Hurricane Ian's motion. Now it's worth noting here, the Florida coastline is oriented southeast to northwest, and the hurricane is coming in from the south-southwest at quite an angle here. So very slight deviations to the left or the right in the hurricane's track could lead to larger deviations in the ultimate landfall location where the eye crosses the coastline. So the details will certainly matter here. All hurricanes wobble. All hurricanes move off course by little bits, a couple dozen miles, not uncommon. We're not going to pin down the landfall location with exact certainty here, and we'll be watching the trends in Ian's motion on radar and satellite imagery very closely. Anywhere in the red area where the hurricane warning is currently issued could theoretically see a direct landfall from this eye as it moves across the coastline, and that's where the strongest, most extreme winds and storm surge damage will take place. But there is a much larger area of still strong wind that could cause damage in the orange area here that will be encompassing much of the Florida Peninsula no matter where the exact landfall point is. Now, in terms of the intensity forecast, we talked about this structure on radar being very healthy, unfortunately, showing a hurricane poised to intensify. And at this point, it's going to become a race against time between the storm's organization and the disruption to the storm that is likely to occur near the time of landfall 
due to increasingly hostile conditions for the storm. If you look at the GFS upper level wind field here, this is the hurricane coming off of Cuba right now, and we can see the jet streak to the north along the southeast U.S. coastline currently optimally positioned to generate upper level outflow to the north of the storm, which is facilitating Ian's intensification right now. But as the storm comes up and gets north of the Keys and starts approaching the Florida coastline, we are going to see much more southwesterly flow hitting it in the rear as the subtropical jet comes across the Gulf of Mexico. And so wind shear will increase significantly, potentially over 30 knots by the time the hurricane arrives at the coastline. And this is going to have an impact on Ian's inner core at some point. The question is whether that occurs before or after landfall. This is the mid-level moisture plot from the GFS showing the closed dark ring of moisture indicating a closed eye wall, such as we observe on radar right now. And you'll see as the hurricane comes up, we maintain that really closed dark ring indicating a healthy inner core structure, which indicates the hurricane will likely be at peak intensity when the structure looks like this. But as it nears the coastline on the GFS, eventually we start to see dry air getting wrapped around the southern and eastern side as the southwesterly shear starts pushing these brown colors in toward the storm core. And at some point, that gets into the core and starts eating away at the eye wall. So near the time of landfall, you'll notice that the southern half becomes brown and we only have a half ring of dark green on the north side. That is the wind shear disrupting the inner core and eroding the eye wall on half of the hurricane. This is going to happen. It's just a question of whether it happens before landfall or not. So in terms of the details of just how extreme conditions can get for folks on the coastline, we'll be hoping for this disruption to happen earlier rather than later. Unfortunately, with the landfall timing shifting to sooner, now Wednesday evening and farther south on the official forecast, that gives less time for the wind shear to act upon the storm. So it's going to be close at this point. A track farther north would have been better in the sense that the storm would have had more time to weaken, now perhaps less time for that to occur on the current forecast. This is another look at the, the Hurricane Center's track here, and another thing to highlight is that this really slows down 8 a.m. Wednesday, 8 p.m. Wednesday, and 8 a.m. Thursday, really crawling here as it nears the coastline. We've expected this slowdown, a prolonged, uh, prolonged time period of severe impacts is coming, and it's worth noting that the impacts will, will span a spectrum of things. We're going to be talking, of course, about the winds in the eyewall as the system approaches land, uh, but also storm surge, really the killer and the dangerous impact from major hurricanes, especially in this section of Florida coastline, which is very vulnerable to storm surge. And we could see values as high as 12 feet in some places like Charlotte Harbor. And now that the landfall is potentially coming in south of Tampa Bay, we could see really high water level rises uh, in that area near Fort Myers and Port Charlotte. And to this section of coastline, uh, we'll see a lot of inundation. Important to note, though, that if the eye does indeed come in south of Tampa Bay, that does not mean your storm surge goes away. We've seen a lot of chatter about the, the worst case scenario for Tampa Bay where the eye comes into the north and you get the, the water getting pushed in with the southwest wind on the eastern side of the eye wall. That sure would be the worst case scenario for Tampa Bay, but a track to the south very close by is not that much better. Could still see five to eight foot of surge. You may get a different zone where the flooding is strongest based on the wind direction being different. So perhaps uh, some different shorelines of the bay would get worse surge. But those details are also hard to guarantee and it's a complex set of terrain here and everything. So very strong winds and surge are coming to the region even if the landfall is to the south and the landfall could still come closer to Tampa Bay. It's not guaranteed to be toward the south at this point. Uh, we can't guarantee the different wobbles that the hurricane may or may not take on its way toward the coastline. So you have to assume that uh, the worst kind of track is going to happen. If you're in this kind of zone, you have to assume the eye is coming into that location and be prepared accordingly. If there's an evacuation order for your section of coastline, please take those very seriously. Lots of flooding is going to occur here in residential areas. This is the wind probability swath showing the arrival of tropical storm conditions will be much uh, much sooner than the eye gets ashore. We'll, we're talking about Tuesday night getting up the Keys and into the South Florida. Wednesday morning it's spreading up to the Tampa Bay area. We know the eye is expected to cross the coastline around Wednesday evening, so we're talking about 
12 to 18 hours in advance of that is when dangerous conditions start to arrive. You can see that in red here, 70% chance or greater of 40 mile per hour or stronger winds over a wide swath of the Florida Peninsula. We now have warnings and watches across the entirety of this region, including Miami and southeastern Florida. So potential for strong wind is there and power outages may be a problem. And inland flooding uh, will also be a problem here. Now this hurricane will be moving slowly like I talked about. That unfortunately enhances the potential for high rainfall totals, especially to the north of the track. Note that the Hurricane for Center forecast is for a landfall near Sarasota. Note where the axis of highest rainfall is. It's in Tampa and it's across this north central part of Florida as the hurricane begins to move inland. And the reason for that is because of the wind shear pattern I told you about. With the wind shear out of the southwest, when a major hurricane is making landfall, the strongest part of the eyewall is always to the left of that shear vector. In this case, the north and northwest side of the system's center. So we're going to see the highest rainfall totals just north of the landfall point as we will see some dry air getting in on the southern side, hopefully reducing rainfall totals for southern Florida as the hurricane nears the coast. And that's the expectation. But up here in central Florida, we could see much higher rainfall totals. And you can see that reflected in this graphic here. Lower totals in south Florida, though still potentially enough to cause flash flooding in flood prone areas. But to the north, much higher totals, 15 to 20 inches possible in some of these areas. And we're talking about Northeast Florida too. This track comes inland and then slows to a crawl and could even get close to the coastline of Northeast Florida and Georgia. So we're going to see high rainfall totals in places like Jacksonville down to Daytona Beach, areas inland of that. And we're also talking about storm surge. I, sh I showed you the surge graphic. It's not just Southwest Florida, it's also Eastern Florida, potentially up to six feet of surge near Jacksonville and Savannah, Georgia, and all these areas where a lot of easterly flow is going to be coming down. We have a big cold surge over the southeast U.S. right now, so there's a lot of northeast wind in advance of the hurricane as the hurricane moves in. And then as the hurricane moves toward the east coast of Florida, we could see a renewed flow of south and southeast wind uh, continuing to push water toward the coastline. And at this point, with track trends the way they are, you know where the storm is now, 8 a.m. Friday, it's very close to the northeast Florida coastline. It's not going up here inland. It could even uh, peak back out over water, which would increase the wind flow. And uh, we could even see a slight re-intensification of the storm at that time. Worth noting that the GFS, if you look at the upper level wind field, yes, we have a lot of shear at the time of landfall, but the, the jet, the subtropical jet over the Gulf, it's kind of along this line here, and as the hurricane moves north toward northeast Florida, what you'll see is that the jet axis ends up to the south of the storm, and the storm emerges north of that jet axis, and wind shear may actually slightly decrease again uh, as this upper level trough kind of digs in to uh, the Mississippi Valley, and then we see the hurricane or the tropical storm likely at this point kind of in the crease of that upper level trough and wind shear may decrease just a little bit. So if it pops out over water, we could see enhanced winds and surge along the coastlines of Northeast Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. So now we're talking about impacts, you know, even extending beyond Florida here, this track would also result in a lot of rainfall uh, to the Southeast of the Appalachians. Again, there's a lot of cold air here and we have warm moist air getting forced overriding that cold air being lifted and causing rain. So you'll see on the forecast here from the GFS, a lot of moisture shows up to the southeast of the Appalachians and then into the Appalachians themselves. So we will see rain and it may not all show up on this particular graphic here because I think this only goes out a few days, but you can see some of that rainfall spreading up here where flooding could become a problem even well after the landfall down in Florida. So wide ranging impacts here. We've even got a slight chance of tornadoes according to the Storm Prediction Center in South Florida today. You'll see some of those bands here. Some of these outer bands, especially to the northeast of a hurricane like this, could have rotation. And so there could be dangerous conditions as you're trying to prepare for the landfall. So be careful out there today. Uh, but I do hope you're preparing. This is a major hurricane, significant event. Life-threatening conditions are coming for many, so please take it seriously. We'll be tracking it closely over the rest of today and tomorrow and beyond. That's it for now, everyone. Thanks for watching.